Good morning and welcome to this time of worship at West Salem Christian Church. I hope that you had a very Merry Christmas yesterday and I'm glad that we can be together for worship this morning. Today is going to be a little bit of a abridged service, a little shorter maybe, uh, just because of some of the demands of Christmas Eve and the other service that we did this week. But I'm glad that we have this time to, uh, to begin this time after Christmas and look forward to the new year gathering together to worship our Heavenly Father. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations true. The of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his Thank you. 
Good morning. As we prepare for our prayer time, would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Let me repeat that again. It's Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we bow before you as we worship your holy name. In Genesis, you spoke concerning your promise of victory over the deserved punishment of death and its cause, our sin. Your zeal has accomplished this. Your son Jesus, born of a virgin, has saved us through his redemptive sacrifice. Your Bible, from cover to cover, reveals your committed love, your mercy, your sovereignty, and your holiness, and your wisdom. Your son Jesus reminds us that those who see him are seeing the Father. Thank you for revealing to us who you are. And thank you to Jesus, who became the Lamb, who takes away the sin of the world. Father, we pray for this truth to be revealed to someone today who needs your salvation. Through your Holy Spirit and your word, shed light into the darkness of broken hearts and lives. Just as the light of day reveals the features of the land, may your light reveal to them their unsaved condition and need of you. May they respond to your call with the affirmation of obedient faith. Father, we turn our thoughts now to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are under attack physically and spiritually. Gird them with your strength and word so that in faith they may resist Satan. We pray for those who are in isolation, to be given a special measure of joy and patience during these difficult times. We also pray for our leaders, whether they acknowledge you or not. We pray that they would realize that they need you and be given your wisdom. Thank you for them and their service. We also pray for those who labor to keep us safe, asking for renewal of strength and spirit, as we also pray for our nation's spiritual state. We confess to you that we are sinful, and without Jesus, our Lamb, our High Priest, and our King, no one can be saved. We individually confess our sins to you now, and thank you, Father, for your cleansing. As we sing songs of worship and hear your word today, may our spirits respond with joy and thanksgiving for our mighty God. Thank you for being our fortress in times of trouble and our salvation from sin and death. For we pray together in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I hope you all had a very Merry Christmas, and I hope that you were able to spend time with people that you love. I hope you were able to eat some good food and enjoy conversations and laughter and, and fun with family and friends. I hope you were able to thank God for the gift of His Son. But whatever kind of celebration or observance you had for Christmas, there's one thing that all of us now have in common. We have the aftermath of the event to contend with. Here we are, the day after Christmas, 
And some of us may still have a, a huge mess at home. There may be wrapping paper piled on the floor, or ribbons and bows strewn around the room. There might be dishes stacked in the sink and on the counter around the house. There might be containers of food filling our refrigerators and candy and snacks and all sorts of other things covering the table. But maybe some of us have other types of aftermaths of Christmas to deal with. For some of us, it's a huge source of stress and effort uh, to, to have to be around people at Christmas. Expectations that we put on ourselves or that other people put on us can be difficult to deal with. Family disagreements or disappointments can be really hard for some of us to get through. Everywhere we look in the aftermath of Christmas, there are things that can threaten to steal our joy. But all of those things, worry, stress, uncertainty, regret, and on and on and on, all those things are exactly why Christmas was necessary. And all those things are why Christmas is still such good news for us and for the world today. When we look at the first Christmas, we can see that it was very different, obviously, in some ways, but very much the same in many very important ways. One of the obvious things that can sometimes be similar for us is that the aftermath of the first Christmas was filled with stress. For us, the stress following Christmas can be caused by a lot of things, like we mentioned just a minute ago. The cleaning up after the chaos can stress us out. Maybe traveling for get-togethers or celebrations is something that, that causes stress. A lot of us probably deal with financial stress after Christmas, having to live up to the expectations uh, of gifts and parties and traveling can leave us wondering how we we'll, we're going to make the little bit of money we have left last for the rest of the month. Maybe some of us are wondering how we'll pay off the credit card bills that we racked up preparing for Christmas. And there are many, many other things in the aftermath of Christmas that can cause us to feel stressed out and uh, anxious. And Jesus' little family had all sorts of stresses in the aftermath of that first Christmas, too. They were far from home. They didn't have any extra resources. They didn't ha even have a, a normal room to call their own. They were staying in a barn. The newborn king had been laid in a feeding trough for animals. They were alive and healthy, but it was a rough beginning for this family. But they had their faith and their trust in the promises of God to get them through. God had promised them who this child would be and what he would do. And by faith, they believed and obeyed. In Luke 1, 30-33, it says, But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And Joseph got a similar promise and explanation from the angel, too. And just like Mary and Joseph, we also have God's promises to see us through. Even in times of stress and concern and worry and uncertainty. See, Jesus promises us that we can come to him and that he will help us to deal with whatever we're facing. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in the aftermath of this Christmas, let's make a habit of taking our cares and worries to Jesus and allowing him to give us rest. Let's find rest for our souls by giving our lives to him each day. And one of the things that can cause us to have that worry and concern is things that seem to threaten our comfort and well-being. Especially over the last couple of years, we have been faced with daily, almost constant reminders of the threats that we're facing. We hear about COVID-19 and the new variants each day, and we hear about the risk associated with some of the treatments, and we hear about the mental health effects that some of the response to COVID uh, is having on certain people, and we hear about other countries that are building up military presence here or there around the world. We hear about uh, regimes and terrorist states developing nuclear weapons and on and on and on and on and we're totally surrounded by threats all the time and that also is nothing new the aftermath of the first christmas was filled with threats just think of the reason that mary and joseph were in bethlehem in the first place they had to go there because caesar augustus had commanded a census be taken of the entire roman world that included israel 
and everyone in Israel knew what this was all about, this census. Caesar wanted this census so that he could be more efficient about taxing and controlling his entire kingdom. So Mary and Joseph lived under the threat of Roman power and control every single day. And then, of course, there was the other king, Herod, who was in direct control of Bethlehem and Judea, but was an extension and in some ways an amplification of that Roman threat. We know that when he found out that there were rumors of a newborn king, he saw it as a threat to his power, and when he couldn't get specifics, he had all the boys, two years old and younger, killed in the area of Bethlehem. Jesus and his family were faced with mortal threats from the day that he was born. But they had the guidance and equipping of God to help them to escape and avoid those threats. God knew what all the threats were to his plan, and he equipped Mary and Joseph with the resources and the information to keep them and his son safe. And just like he knew the real threats facing his people then, God knows the real threats that are facing us today. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. God has given us the resources to face, endure, and overcome the threats in our life. Not always in the way that we think. We will have struggles. We will fight battles in this world that we will lose. But when we put on the full armor of God, we will be able to stand in the midst of the storms in this life and know that we're never alone and that no matter what threat we're facing, we can face it knowing that we are standing on the foundation of God's purpose and His will. And that is such an important thing for us, because if we don't have that foundation, then we can easily get lost in confusion. And that is something else that we have in common with that first Christmas. The aftermath of the first Christmas was filled with uncertainty. Yes, I remember that I just said a few minutes ago that Mary and Joseph had their faith in God's promises to carry them through. And no, I haven't changed my mind on that point, but... I think that faith and trust are something that can exist at the same time as uncertainty. Mary and Joseph trusted that this baby was God's son. They trusted that he would be who God promised and do what God promised he would do, but they didn't know all the details of how that would happen. In Matthew 2, 13 through 15, uh, and then 19 through 23, we read this. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. And so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. When I imagine what Mary and Joseph had hoped for their lives, I think they planned on returning to their homes and families after this baby was born. They would have been part of a close-knit community and a family group that they would have relied on for help and support. But now, after the baby's born, here comes the angel again telling them that they have to flee to Egypt to avoid the fury of a king. And I don't know because the Bible doesn't say, but I have to think that this seemed like an unexpected detour to Mary and Joseph. 
But the key to all of this is it wasn't unexpected to God. In those verses, we see that through this plan, God fulfilled two prophecies that he had given centuries before through a prophet. But it wasn't just God's plan and his messages through the angels. Mary and Joseph had to continue to obey and to follow. They had to take God's word and put it into action. And that's the same thing, the same way that we have to face uncertainty today. Unfortunately, most of us won't be visited by an angel. And I'm always frustrated that I can't just have a burning bush in my backyard where I can go and get direct marching orders from God every, every day. But we do have his spirit within us guiding us, speaking to us, but we also have God's word, his word, which is true and living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And with God's word and our obedience, we can move forward in confidence, even though we might not have all the details. We can be faithful to God's word wherever we find ourselves, whether in Bethlehem, in Egypt, Nazareth, or Oregon. And if we're faithful to God's word, even if we don't know exactly what we should do, we will know who we should be. James 1, through 25 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it, do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So in God's word, we can find who we are supposed to be. We can find freedom. We can find purpose and hope. And while the aftermath of the first Christmas was filled with all sorts of struggles, things like stress and threats and uncertainty, the truth is that all those things were happening in the midst of God's eternal plan for salvation. And that is very good news because it means that the aftermath of the first Christmas was filled with hope. It's so easy for us to get distracted and and lose sight of hope. The day-to-day grind of life, the business, the commitments, the schedule, it can all seem to drown out God's still small voice reminding us that we have hope beyond measure. And when Mary and Joseph were in a similar situation. We talked a couple of weeks about how, how uh, weeks ago, how they brought Jesus to the temple to have him circumcised in accordance with the law. They were doing their best to honor God's commands. They, they'd made the trip up from Bethlehem to, Judea, or to Jerusalem with an infant that was just a few days old. They were very uh, poor. They didn't have very many resources. They were trying to give God the best they could with what they had. I'm sure it was a hectic and frantic day for them. But God had promised this man named Simeon that he would live to see the Messiah. And Simeon was at the temple the day that Jesus was brought there as a baby. In Luke 2, 28 through 33, it says, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Simeon saw hope in Jesus, salvation, revelation, the glory of God. And Mary and Joseph knew all that. They knew their little boy would be the promised one that God had sent to save his people from their sins. But they were in the thick of a busy and stressful day, They were just trying to get through it. And then they they marveled at what was said about their son. And I think that's because they'd gotten so busy that they'd forgotten, maybe just for a moment, the hope that this little baby embodied. And that hope never ends. That hope is the same for us today. And if we accept Jesus, if we're in him, then we're born into a new life in him and into a living hope. 1 Peter 1, 3-7 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to You may have had to suffer grief and and trials of all kinds. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, 
of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So as we face the aftermath of this Christmas and we look forward to a new year, let's remember that God understands that in this world we're going to have stress and we'll face threats and we'll have uncertainty. But let's remember that God's will and His plan can work just fine in the midst of all those things. And even though we face grief and trials, let's remember that this day after Christmas and every day after that first Christmas is filled with hope and an inheritance in God's kingdom that can never perish or spoil or fade because of the gift of Jesus and that he's given himself fully for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the inheritance that we have in Jesus, that we know that the hope that we have can never be taken away, that there's nothing in this world that can separate us from your love that's in Jesus. And that we have a hope that we can hold on to through trials and through stresses and through uncertainty and, and through the threats that, uh, that face us every day in this life. And, and we can know that uh, there is a higher calling and a higher purpose for us because we have been called according to your purpose and called according to your will. And we have come to you through your son, Jesus. And so we pray that you would guide us and direct us and lead us and help us to look into your word and do what it says so that we can know who we're supposed to be and so that you will know that we trust you because we do our very best to live according to your will. We thank you for Christmas. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for this new year ahead. And we pray that you would use us in, in amazing ways as you work in our lives and, and use us for your glory and for the, the growth of your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in our message today, we talked about a lot of the challenges that uh, we can face in our lives and about the hope that overcomes all of those and, and outlasts all of those challenges because we find that hope in Jesus. But for our time of communion, I wanted to read from the Gospel of Luke, the 22nd chapter, and look at uh, the reason that Jesus instituted this uh, meal of communion 
It says at beginning in verse 14, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that his apostles were going to be left uh, without him for at least for a few days and then for, uh, for years after he ascended back into heaven. And he knew that they would need to be reminded and focus on what his sacrifice meant. And so he says that he had looked forward to this meal with them before he has to suffer because I think partly he wanted to give them the gift of this commemoration, this meal, to help them to remember and to keep them focused on the hope that they have in him and that we have in him. And then continuing on in verse 17, it says, After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so Jesus institutes this meal for his apostles, and he reminds them to, every time they do it, to think of the sacrifice that he is going to make. And they don't understand at this point what he means, but after uh, his death and his burial and his resurrection, this meal takes on a whole new meaning. And it holds that same meaning for us, the meaning of remembering the sacrifice of Jesus and the hope that springs from that for us every day. And so each week at communion, we remember that sacrifice by taking the bread together to remember his body that was broken for us. And by taking juice to remember his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you for communion, this meal, this simple act to take together as a family, but it's so profound because it recenters us and it refocuses our lives on the sacrifice that Jesus made and, and the hope that uh, is at the core of that, that is at the center of our lives, that hope beyond this life, that hope beyond struggle, and that hope that uh, you have loved us enough to include us in your kingdom and your family and to include us in your mission in this world. We thank you for the love that we seek so clearly in the gift of Jesus at Christmas time and in the sacrifice that he made for us. And we thank you so much in the name of Jesus. Amen. For our time of giving this morning, I just wanted to let you know uh, how appreciative I am and how grateful I am and how proud I am of your generosity. Um, we have been going through our Big Give Christmas offering this these last few weeks, and we set a goal of $3,000 as an initial goal that would provide socks for a, a uh, homeless ministry in, in Salem. Uh, and another $1,500 to go to the Farkerchers, our, our missionaries, another $1,000 to go to Hope Pregnancy Clinic. And that $3,000 was all given outside the church to, to other ministry organizations. And then we had a, a miracle goal of $4,000 to uh, buy a, 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 a tablet and a printer and some things for a children's check-in uh, at the church that would, that would provide us a, a better way to, uh, to organize our children's ministry. I'm proud to say that we have reached our $3,000 goal. The last numbers that I had uh, were, we were at about $3,049. So we're just over uh, that, that goal and we're on our way to our miracle goal. And so we'll continue our big give offering uh, through the next couple of weeks into the new year just a little bit. And I know uh, for some of us, it's easier to give after Christmas to something special like this. And so I want to thank you for your continued faithful gifts and tithes that you've given to the ministry of the church and then above and beyond what you've given for this uh, big give Christmas offering. And I believe that God is using us to bless other people. And I believe because of that, and because of our, our faith in him and our generosity, that he will bless us as a church and as individuals as well as we, we uh, give to him 
uh, so that uh, that he can use our gifts to bless other people and to to uh, to glorify himself through those things. So thank you for your giving, and I look forward to what God is going to continue to do uh, through the gifts uh, of West Salem Christian Church. Thank you again for being here. I'm glad that we could be together for this time of worship this morning. I hope it was encouraging to you. I hope that uh, it sets a tone for looking forward to the new year to come, uh, to, to live in the hope that Jesus provides us each and every day. Let's get ready to pray as we uh, close our service with a closing song here after this. But I want to invite you back uh, next week. We'll be both in person at the church and online here at 1030 a.m. next Sunday morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for um, the hope that you give us in the midst of all the other things that we face in life. We are going to have stress and concern and worry and, and misunderstanding and, and questions, but we know that we can rest in your truth and your love and your grace and in the hope that you've given us through Jesus. And so we pray that we would live lives of hope and faith and that, uh, that those would uh, make a difference in this world, that people would be drawn to you because of the hope and the faith that they see in us. We love you and we trust you and we ask you to lead us forward into this new year to come uh, in just a few days here as we, uh, as we follow you and, and do our best to live our lives fully in your will. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're never gonna let